We have just started in Revelation chapter 9, and we are looking at verse 1 where it talks about, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. If you look in the very first chapter of Revelation, Revelation 1, 20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. In that verse, this is a, a mystery that is defined as stars being interpreted as angels and candlesticks representing church, the churches, okay? This is symbolic. It's telling you that it is. Yeah. You're, they're not actually stars, but they are angels. And when I look over in Revelation 12, I see that when Satan fell, uh, in verse 3, Revelation 12, 3, it says, There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. I'm not going to read the rest of that, but it says in verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. Okay? His tail drew a third part of the stars. That It tells me it's not really talking about heavenly bodies that you see out there at night, but he's talking about fallen angels. He caused a third, again, a third part of angels to fall with him. Um, and this chapter 12 talks about a war in heaven. In verse 7, it says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Two groups of angels. One are good, and the other, the dragon, representing the devil, because you look at verse 9, it says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So I see in verse 4, it calls them stars. But down here, as you look in verse 9, he was cast out, talking about the devil, and his angels were cast out with him. Uh, that's just very clear to me, and I, mm -hmm. I hope it is to you too, that we are talking about uh fallen angels whether you call them devils or demons or whatever you call them they're not good they are not good here's another thing he was given the key to the bottomless pit so i want you to know you know there's when the lord comes he's going to establish what we call the millennial reign here on earth that millennial means one thousand 1,000 years here on earth. But during that time, it tells us that Satan is going to be bound. I'm looking at Revelation 20. And um, 1 through 3, it says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Here's the difference here. <clears throat> This angel is a good one because he's coming down from heaven, right? If, something, if something's coming up out of the earth, because that's where hell is, uh -huh. the bottomless pit, that's not good. I, I just, in your mind, think this is not good. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And verse 3 says, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, 
till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. I don't know how long that is. It just simply says a little season. But you, I just want you to know, if you're with the Lord, you have nothing to be worried about because when Satan is loosed, he's going to go out and deceive those nations, it tells us, that um, will be, he'll gather together, uh, Gog and Magog, and um, there'll be a war again, a war again, but fire is going to come down and consume them. I, I'm looking on ahead in Revelation 20. We're not there yet. So he doesn't learn his lesson after a thousand years. Oh, no. Let me tell you, even though he has suffered all these things of knowing what it's like to be in the presence of God, he, he, he has deceived himself, truly, because he thinks he's the winner. Even though I'm looking in black and white and can see it, but he can't. He's not going to give up. Not going to give up. There's no good thing in the devil. Not one good thing. Okay. No, no, he's not learning this lesson. And he's not repented either. He's, he's, he's going into the lake of fire. I can read that in Revelation 20. He's smart enough to know that. But the way he wants to find God is to drag the people down there with him. Yeah, you know, he knows where his destination is. And he wants to take as many as he can with him. And it's almost like he's saying to God, I'm going to get even. I'm going to get even. You know how some people think, I'm going to get even with you. That's what the Lord laid on my heart the other day. Because I was just saying there was so many. I had phone call after phone call. Pray I need this. Pray I need that. You know, and I, There's so many things. And catastrophes and bad things that happen and I thought that is just Satan trying to lash out and he knows a lot of people will blame God right why would he be why would he let a baby die why would he let some something good happen something so bad happen to a good person it's Satan it's our enemy that's right and he expects he wants us to get to have enough love and faith and trust in him that we don't blame him for catastrophes. That right. we know who our enemy is. That's right. Even when the worst thing happens. Right. One like of you, Job. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. You, you know it's not God's it's fault. It's not God doing it. No. It's this fallen world and the enemy we live in. Okay. I'm going back into Revelation chapter 9, and I see here he's given this key to the bottomless pit. And verse 2, he says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. I was just thinking about that. You know, Smoke rises. If you've got a fire in your fireplace, you better have your flue open, right? right. Uh, that flue is that thing that keeps, uh, you know, you kind of bank your fire and you, you want a good draw, but you, you know what I'm saying. It has to go up. And if you were in a house fire, the firemen will tell you, if you're in the house, you need to get on the floor and crawl out. Because if you try to run out, see, the smoke is rising. It's going to fill the top part first. Mm -hmm. And if you will get down on your knees. Heat and, rises. And smoke yes, rises. that's right. You're better off on the ground and crawl out um, that way. So just keep those things. And hell is in the bowels of this earth. Mm -hmm. And it is going to come up out of there. And then it says in verse 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. 
and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, I, I, I just want you to realize that I believe that these are demonic. They may be called locusts. They have, because you look at the next verse, it, they, it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So these are not normal locusts, because if you're familiar with locusts or grasshoppers, that they their appetite is for anything that's green, right? So these are not your normal locusts. And they have been given power, as it said in verse 3, as the scorpions. Now, every once in a while, you know, this is a dry, I, I find scorpions. I don't know whether you ever find them at your house, um, but they're here. And the ones that we see are not very big. Yeah. Truly, they're like an inch or two. Yeah. They're, they're, they're real small. And, and I'm not afraid to step on one. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm going to kill them. I've never been stung by one, but I respect them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm real careful. I don't just pick them up with my hand. <laughs> I just get a paper towel or tissue and pick them up that way after I've squished them. That's, right. I'm being plain. Right. It's like, I don't want to experience the sting. Right. Okay, I'm gonna read you verse four. It says, it was commanded then that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, this is the second time that we are seeing hurt not the ones that have their seal, the seal of God in their forehead. Uh, I'm going to go backwards into chapter 7 because we, that was the first time. Uh, verse 3. Revelation 7 and verse 3 says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our, uh, of our God in their foreheads. So we see the seal of God is in their forehead. You see it there in 7 and 3, and you see it here in um, chapter 9 and verse 4. That's where you are sealed, is in your forehead. Okay, those two verses there talk about the seal of God in your far forehead. I'm going to give you two other verses that talk about your father's name being in your forehead. So I look over here at Revelation 14. It says in the first verse, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a uh, an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Foreheads. I read you um, when we were covering chapter seven. I read you out of Ezekiel chapter nine about a verse four because we see that there was a man that was um, given an inkhorn and he was supposed to seal the servants to write upon their foreheads. And so that was in Ezekiel 9 and verse 4. I read that a couple of weeks ago. But having their father's name written in their forehead, I equate that with having the seal of God. And the other verse that talks about that is in Revelation 22 and I'll read you verses 3 and 4. Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4, it says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. See, there's a little colon at the end of that verse 3. And verse 4 says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their forehead. See, you have two verses that talk about having 
their father's name and their forehead. And you have two verses that say that they are sealed in their foreheads. So as I look at this, I want you to know it's very, and you know, when, when he, the Lord speaks in the gospels and he says, verily, 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 I say unto you, I want you to say, I very, it's very important to have the seal of God when, now, I think you need to have it now because you don't know how all these things are, how fast are they going to play out? You know, we look ahead and we say, okay, 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days. That equates to three and a half years. You don't want to wait till you see the first signs happening. Uh, truly, we're in the beginning of sorrows now. But when is the trumpets really going to start? When are the seals opened? When are all these wars going to take place? These catastrophes, the signs in the heavens, when are they going to start? Are, are you going to wait till that time to think, okay, what did she say about the seal of God? Mm, I wonder I wonder if I can find that, or maybe I really need to think about that seriously. I want to give you three verses that tell us that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I, I, am I losing anybody? I, I don't want to. I want to give you three verses that will tell us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The first one I look at is in the book of Ephesians. It too is in um, Ephesians 1, chapter 1 of Ephesians. Earlier when I was talking about being predestinated, I read you verse 11. But in verse 13, it says, In whom... Of course, the last verse uh, 12 says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In verse 13, it says, whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Do you see that that says that you're sealed? by the Holy Spirit of promise. And then I turn my pages to Ephesians chapter four. And I look at verse 30, it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. I, I just want you to know that day of redemption, you can look at yourself right now and say, well, I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed by his blood. But the day of redemption is really talking about a day in the future when he comes back to claim the ones that he has purchased with his blood. That's the day of redemption. That's in the future. It has not taken place yet. But I can say I've been redeemed. His blood has purchased me. It's cleansed me from all my sins. Okay, I gave you two. Let me give you one more. This is in uh, 2 Corinthians, in the first chapter. I'll read you 21 and 22. This is 2 Corinthians, first chapter, verses 21 to 22. It says, Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Verse 22, who has also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And, and that really, you know, it says, well, that's in your heart, not your forehead. That's, that's being technical, right? <laughs> because really you have to be in Christ. It says in that verse 21, establishes us with you in Christ. And so um, I'm grateful to George for in his messages that has been talking about in Christ, because a lot of people think that you just believe in Jesus. And that's, that's where it begins. You do have to, you have to believe, you have to have faith and you have to trust in it, but you are obligated 
to act upon your faith through baptism. And so I gave you three three verses that tell us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You want that seal. Don't leave this world without it. This is so important. I'm just trying to, to stress to you the next three woes that we're talking about with these locusts and the next ones are ones that are coming out of the Euphrates and that's a, a terrible war. Some people call it the sixth trumpet war. Okay, and the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, is at the coming of the Lord. We're going to cover those. But you want the seal now. It, um, so I gave you three that tell us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. I want to give you three that tell us that we are baptized into Christ. That if you could just realize that you, it's not just by faith, but you have to put your faith in operation and go ahead, find yourself a preacher, a minister that is going to take you and dip you in water, water baptism, in the name of Jesus. That name of Jesus, it's the name given above all names. It's the name of the whole family. You read that in Ephesians chapter 3 that the whole family is called after this. I read in the first chapter of Hebrews that Jesus inherited his name. It's, there's plenty of scripture. You can just read through the book of Acts and see that they always baptize in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, those are titles. You have a name. Your name is not father or mother or sister you have a name that you're called by. And once you have that name of Jesus called over you in the ba baptismal waters, you are taking that name, right. taking that name. And the Holy Spirit is a promise that is given to every one of us. You do your part in water baptism and seek for his spirit. You won't be dis disappointed. I'm going to give you three verses that we're baptized into Christ. Uh, Romans 6 3 says know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death so baptized into Jesus Christ you see it there in Romans 6 3 Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 it says for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ see that's number two baptized into Christ. And I'm going to read you out of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 and I'll read you verse 13. It says here in chapter 12 verse 13 it says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. I hope you see that that, that body, oh, well the verse before it says, for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. We are baptized into his body. Do you see that? Three, three verses. That word is established. Uh, John 3.3 3, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And verse 5, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This, the seal of God is actually two parts. The first part is water baptism in the name of Jesus, and the second part, Part is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so they're, they go together, water and spirit. I just want you to see that. Does anybody have questions there? It's a tremendous truth, something that everybody needs to know, and certainly as the day of the Lord approaches, that you be a part of his body, that you be in Christ. 
Okay, I'm looking back in Revelation chapter 8, and I'm looking at verse 5. It says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. Okay, when it talks about that there should be tormented, they should not kill them, and that they should be tormented five months is talking about those people that do not have the seal of God that's talked about that we, in verse 4 that we just talked about. That's why I say the Lord makes a difference between his, his family members, his body, and those people that are just out there doing their own thing, not caring about anything that belongs to the Lord. And then, at verse 6, it says, And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. The torment is going to be so bad that some people were, are going to wish that they were dead, right? There, and I realize that sometimes people hurt so bad that they'd rather, that's why we have suicides, right? Mm -hmm. People cannot take the pain and would rather go through death than face what they're facing. But this verse says that death shall flee from them. That's going to be their desire, but it's not going to happen. As we go on here, and it describes them, it says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sounds of chariots of many horses running to battle. And verse 10 says, And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was given to hurt men five months. That five months goes along with what we saw in verse 5. They should be tor tormented five months. I read you that whole description from verse 7 on down into chapter 10 because it's all describing how these uh, locusts are appearing. These are not normal locusts. No, no, no. <clears throat> not at all like that. In fact, I have uh, heard some end-time ministers that believe that these are actually talking about helicopters used in war, right? Because it, it talks about the sound. It be more like a big drone or something. Uh, now that we know more about drones. Yes. They can go, they're very precise in their executions. You know, well, here's the thing with drones and, um, well, I, I don't know about drones, but the helicopters that have those guns that are mounted on their tails or out there in the front of them, those, those are weapons of war that are really prepared to kill. Right. And these are not, they are ordered not to kill, just to torment mm -hmm. like a scorpion. So... Um, they're a little bit different, and, and um, I'm just saying, I think that these are demons. Demons, devils that mm -hmm. are just um, coming up out of the ground. And the reason why I say that, because I look at verse 11, and I say, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, has his name, Apollyon. My footnote tells me that those words, Abaddon in the Greek, uh, Hebrew and Apollyon in the Greek, 
means destroyer. They have a king over them, right? Mm -hmm. That they are subject to that is a destroyer. That makes me think that these are demonic spirits that are subject to somebody that is over them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, our time is, is about up. Did anybody have any questions there? Yeah, it's food for thought, right? right. <laughs> right. A lot to think at. And I just, I want to stress it again. It's so important to be sealed, to have the seal of God. Right. Absolutely. That should be, I know people prior, prioritize things and say, well, I'm going to do this first, that. This should be number one on anybody's list. Number one. George, would you like to cl close us out tonight? Praise God. Lord, I want to praise your name. I want to hallow your name. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing we pray. And we, we, we begin to pray, hallow the name of God. So many people, Lord, don't understand the true God. Hallow your name. God, I want to, I want to be the one who has favor with God. And I want to be in your will. Yes, I want to be in your will. I want to praise you because I think he used one of all the points in the Godhead bodily. And no wonder the Bible says all authority, all power is given to you in heaven and earth. Praise God. God go with us now and keep us and lead us into your perfect will. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.